Let's now uh, close our eyes and bow our heads as we pray and ask the Lord to guide us as we look at his word this morning. Our Father, thank you for this uh, special uh, day today and thank you for your presence with us. I can only imagine you having a big smile in heaven because, Lord, you love your people and, and we want to just give you all the praise and the glory in the work that you are doing in our life and especially this morning we celebrate the life that you have um, caused to be reborn and that's uh, Karen and Michelle. And thank you that Michelle could explain to us so well about what you have done in her life. And even when we are pushing her, uh, you away, even when we are thinking that this Christian thing is a cult or whatever, whatever we might think, Lord, I know you're at work. You're the one somehow drawing us back and coming to realise the truth. And I just thank you so much for your patience and for your grace upon our life. I know that in my own life, that I would have pushed you away were it not for you. So thank you for your great heart for us and especially in giving us your son. And uh, we just ask now that you would help us as we look at your precious word. We pray that you would um, give us understanding through your spirit and that you would speak to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. Well, just to let you know that the baptism was pretty warm, wasn't it? That's what you said, I saw you, Michelle. Wow, this is warm. <laughs> so thanks, John. Nice warm bath. My brother John sets it up. And thinking about our uh, warm things, and I was uh, thinking about um, when I was in, um, in 2014, Colin and I and Dennis and Diane were in a place in New Zealand called Rotorua, where you can go into very warm baths. And I'm going to mention something about that trip. I remember... Um, we went to the Tamaki Maori village and um, we went there and um, there were three big bus loads. Our bus driver was called Dennis, who I nicknamed Dennis the Menace. And uh, we get there and two other big bus loads. And then Dennis found out that I'm a pastor and uh, he thought, I know what I'm going to do, I'm going to make this Captain Kirk. He can be the head chief of this big mob who are coming to this Maori village. So he nominated me and I got appointed to be the, the chief of, of the mob. So what does that mean? That meant I had to go onto the open grounds just before the Maori village and everyone else is way behind me. I'm on my own. And then suddenly out of the blue, all these people start coming, these Maoris. And they're coming, you know, and they're doing all sorts of strange things, really strange things. And they're giving me this sort of welcome. What is it called? It's called the haka. The only problem was, is this hucker was right in my face. They are all around me buzzing around. And I had to just stand there and, um, and, and bear their intimidation and, and then they would welcome me into the village and my mob. So, um, so that's how it was. You know how it is, you know? Right in my face, tongue sticking out, <laughs> eyes bulging, slaps to the thighs, grunts and groans. And I had to just stand there. That's how it was. Now, I was thinking about this, that this would be such a strange thing, would it not, if you had no idea, if you had never seen the haka, and if you were in my place, wouldn't that be strange? Yes. Absolutely, right? We seem to know about the haka because of the All Blacks when they're playing rugby. That's how they start off. <laughs> well, I was thinking about that because when it comes to baptism, I know for the majority of us here, this isn't strange. But I've got to remind myself that baptism is pretty strange. If you had a whole lot of people come here from the community, they would be wondering, what on earth is going on? Two people having a public bath with clothes fully on in front of everybody. What is that about? Is that strange or not? No, no response. Is that strange? It is, isn't it? And also in some Christian circles, this is pretty strange because uh, people have been accustomed to um, baptism being the baptism of babies with a little bit of water being sprinkled on their forehead. I got that ha happen to me when I was growing up, not that I remember it, but that's the sort of thing people think about with baptism. And so people can really be thrown in regards to what we did. But you know what? It's no strange thing if you know your Bible. This was commonplace when the church began. And as we read in the book of Acts, that's what they did. They baptised in immersion. It was no strange thing. We're the people who have sort of manipulated and turned things around and gone away from where we should be. And so it, that's how it was. And our people would be baptised publicly, maybe in rivers and lakes or in all sorts of places. 
and they were immersed in water, come up out of the water, that's what happened. And that's what happened in the book of Acts. At the start of the church, Acts chapter 2 is about the birth of the church. And on that great day, in Acts chapter 2, verse 40, uh, 41, we read, So then those who had received his word were baptised, and that day there were um, added about 3,000 souls. So 3,000 people were baptised. How could they baptise 3,000 people in one day? That's a good question. Well, the Bible is the truth. And it did happen. And what Colin and I had the privilege in March 2019, before COVID put a stop on everything, to be in Israel. And uh, I remember being told that this is the place south of the Temple Mount, probably, most probably, where Peter had preached to this great crowd of people. And guess what they have found there through archaeological digs? A whole lot of Jewish ritual baths, perfect for baptisms. God had it worked out. So that's where so many people would have been baptised because God had already planned it. And what a, what a day it would have been when people were baptised on that first day. And this morning, um, looking at Acts chapter 2, we're going to be doing that. I want us to look at baptism. What's it all about? And it might be strange to some, but it's a sign so special. And it's what the Saviour has stipulated for us to do. I praise his name. So let's have a look at our baptism. Um, as we started off in the baptistry, Matthew chapter 28 verse 19 says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptising them. There is the word, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that's exactly what happened when the church was born. So the first thing I've got to tell you is when it comes to baptism, you actually got to leave the word baptism out because there is something so critical that must happen before baptism if you're going to follow God's ways. And what is that? Belief. You need to believe. Baptism in the Bible is always that way around. Believe in Christ and then get baptised. So when I was uh, christened or baptised as a baby, is that the right way around? No. I'm a little infant. I don't know anything yet. I don't have any belief. So why should I get baptised? That's not the biblical way. It's lovely to have devotion. We devote our children to the Lord. It's lovely to have a time where we might give thanks to God for a little baby. But that's not baptism. Baptism is when I believe in Jesus. And it can be a young age. When I believe in Jesus and then I want to get baptised. So that's what we're going to look at first of all. Because before we get to Acts chapter 2 verse 41 where we read about 3,000 souls being baptised, I'm going to show you how it all happened and how they came to belief. So what happened is, in Acts chapter 2, we read about a man called Peter, the Apostle Peter. And it's quite amazing because this is the man who denied Jesus three times. Uh, this is the man who, who um, you know, like, he, he's in a locked room when Jesus is raised from the dead because he's scared of the Jews. But on, in Acts chapter 2... He has just received the Holy Spirit and he now is courageous. He now has such clarity when it comes to what Jesus is about. And he just proclaims so powerfully Jesus. Why is he proclaiming Jesus? Because you've got to believe before you get baptised. And so he's proclaiming Jesus. And I'm going to have a, pick, have a look at a few great verses in Acts chapter 2 that highlight this. I won't read the whole sermon. Okay, in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 24, with conviction, with courage and with clarity, the Apostle Peter preached Jesus. And he says in Acts chapter 2, verses 22 to 24, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performs through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. But God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it was impossible for him to be held by its power. This is Peter preaching. Who's he preaching about? Jesus and God the Father. Peter suddenly gets it. He didn't quite get things beforehand. 
And now he understands that Jesus died according to the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. It was God's will for his son to die. Wow. And he also proclaims the resurrection. This Jesus is the resurrected Lord. And he also is very courageous because he says to them, you put him to death. You notice that? That's pretty courageous, isn't it? Like they might turn on you next. <laughs> but that's Peter. He's preaching the truth. All right, and then we come down to verse 36, the very last verse. It's like coming to the end of the book and reading the last page. But anyway, that's what we're doing. And it says in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So that's what Peter was heading towards. He wanted the people to understand that this Jesus whom you crucified is actually the Lord. And he's actually the Christ. And I want to spend a little bit of time explaining those two great words. Jesus is the Lord. What do we mean by that? We are saying that he is the Son of God. Because Lord is a divine title. We're saying that he is God himself. That he is one with God. They are huge things to declare. Why is Peter saying this about this man? Because of many things, but because of the resurrection especially. He was declared with power to be the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. Not a resuscitation, a resurrection. He truly died and he came alive because he is the Son of God. It was impossible, it says in Acts 2 verse 24, for death to keep him down. Because even though he gave his life for us, he is the author of life. And he broke free from death. And these things should tell us so clearly that he is the son of God. He's not some guru. He's not some other religious leader. He's so much higher than anyone else. He's the son of God. He's the Lord. That's who Jesus is. It's incredible. And I know growing up I thought that Jesus was just a moral teacher. How low is that? And some people just think he's just a prophet. He's so much more than that. And surely if you have any understanding of his life, everything is pointing to the fact that he's the son of God. I mean, he walked on water. He calmed the storms. He raised the dead. He healed the sick. Who can do that but God alone? And all these great events that we read about in the book, uh, the Bible, in the Gospels, they're legitimate. Even Jesus' disciples who recorded these things, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. I remember the time when Jesus calmed this massive storm on the Sea of Galilee by simply getting up and saying, Peace be still. And it says in Mark chapter 4, verse 41, the disciples all said, Who then is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? See them struggling? They're struggling to realise who this one is. But he's the Lord. And that's what we need to come to realise. Jesus is the Lord. He's the Son of God. And not only is he the Lord, he is the Christ. And that's the same word as the Hebrew word Messiah. And what does the word Christ mean? That's what Peter was trying to drive home. He's the Lord and he's the Christ. The Christ means he's the one that God promised to send into our world. How exciting is that? God promised to send someone into our world. And he would come into our world to rescue us from our sins and reconcile us to God. That's his purpose. Is this the one? It sure is. He's the Christ. How do we know? I reckon the clearest indication that he is the Christ is because of how he died upon the cross. Because the Bible says 700 years before Jesus came, 700 years way before crucifixion was even invented, God says to the prophet Isaiah, in Isaiah 53, 5 and 6, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And 700 years before Jesus came, this was prophesied about him and other places too, so that when Jesus came and when he was pierced upon a cross, very, very specific, we would all make that right conclusion. This is the Christ. 
That's what we're meant to do. This is the one. In his love, God promised to send into the world this one who would bring us back to God and allow us to be forgiven of all the wrongs we've done so that we can go to heaven and have eternal life. He's the Christ. He's the Christ. And that's what the uh, Apostle Peter so wanted the, to help the people understand those things. And we haven't even spoken about baptism yet because the key thing is belief. We need to believe. We can't talk about baptism until we believe. Believing in Jesus to be the Lord. Believing in Jesus to be the Christ. And why is belief so much more important than even baptism? Because it's through simple faith in Jesus. Believing in Jesus that we're saved. Salvation is by faith. And how that's spelled out so strongly in the Bible. Boy, did I get this wrong. That's the problem when you don't listen to God, read his word, you're listening to yourselves and other people. I thought uh, you, get, you get to heaven by being a good person. I thought you get to heaven by making sure you don't go to prison. Some people even think you get to heaven by just being an Australian. Back then, you were in a Christian country. No, you don't. <laughs> All right, you, you need to believe in Jesus. So surely there's this great verse, right? John 3.16. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him, who's him? Jesus. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. There it is. God's not trying to make it difficult for us to understand. We need to believe. We need to believe he's the Lord and that he's Christ the Saviour. And also in Acts chapter 16, I, I love this passage, and it says there, uh, there's this Philippian jailer. He's got Paul and Silas in prison. Uh, and they're in the dungeon. And God arranges this really amazing earthquake. He can do these sort of things. No one dies in this earthquake, but all the prison doors are open and all the chains on the prisoners are broken. And they are free. The prisoners are free. But no one escapes. Paul makes sure no one escapes. The Philippian jailer, thinking that everyone had escaped, was going to harm himself, you know, take his life, when Paul says, stop, don't do it. And the Philippian jailer, can you imagine being the Philippian jailer at this point? Oh, that's it, I've had enough. I give in. <laughs> he comes running to Paul and Silas, falls before them, and he says this most important question. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Right. Now this is really critical. Here the Apostle Paul is going to give us the answer. What does he say? He could have said lots of things. If you think of our world, he could have said, live a better life. Be kind to prisoners. Go to church once a week. He could have said all those things, but that would be rubbish. That's not the truth. He says, Paul and Silas say to him so powerfully, so clearly, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. See how strong the Bible is. It's got nothing to do with being a good person because no, no amount of good, good stuff can ever cover up for the wrong things we've done. We need to believe in Jesus. And I want to just spend a bit of time explaining what it means to believe in Jesus because I sure didn't get it when I was younger. Believe in Jesus doesn't mean having all the knowledge in your head and doing nothing about it. Alright, so there came a time when I understood Jesus as God's son, tick that box. Jesus died on the cross for our sins, tick that box. And then I just did my own thing. So to believe in Jesus means I understand who Jesus is and I understand who I am and who am I. In terms of eternity, I'm in trouble with God. I'm going to face judgement one day and it's not going to go well. So what's happening now? I'm understanding I need Jesus. I need Jesus to save me. So that belief is meant to drive us to a place where we trust in him. We commit ourselves to him. I love Romans 10 verse 13 because that's a really great um, verse to help us understand what it looks like to believe. What's Romans 10 13 say? Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's true belief. And so that's a good test for all of us. Have we... If we have a faith or belief that Jesus is God's son and he's the saviour, have we actually called on him to save us? That's a prayer. It's a simple prayer. It's like where you just go, uh, Lord, I, I understand who you are. I understand what you've done for me. 
and I ask you to forgive me. I call on you to save me. It's as simple as that. Isn't it amazing? It's the most simple things that we can miss. And it's that day, I remember when I prayed that prayer, in my bedroom, on the floor, thought I should be on my knees, and I'm probably crying, I was crying, and I asked Jesus to save me from my sins. And that day was the greatest day ever. He came into my life, and he forgave me, and I was saved. And I urge you, if you haven't done that, that you might do that. If you haven't done that, that you would call on the Lord Jesus to save you. So it does require faith. You need to believe that he's real because you, otherwise you're just praying to what thin air. You need to believe that he's real. You need to understand he has died for you and he's willing to save you if you would call on him to save you. So I urge you to do that. And then once we've done that, well, now we can talk about baptism, can't we? So that's what uh, Peter does in the sermon. Uh, and in Acts chapter 2, going back to Acts chapter 2, and let's read now verses 37 to 39. We read there, Now when they heard this, that's the crowd, uh, and not all the crowd because some people were hardened, but now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. Now, okay, what's that mean? Pierced to the heart. It means that they had this conviction that they have just crucified the Son of God and they are, are really concerned about this. They understand now that he is the Lord and that this Jesus is the Christ. And they are pierced to the heart. See, they're believing, aren't they? They're believing that this is who he is. Okay, so there's, there's belief coming in. And then Peter, and then they, now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Now they've already believed and you need to understand that that's why Peter says these words in verse 38. Peter said to them, repent. And it's keep on repenting by the way. Turn from your sins. And it also says, and let each of you be baptised in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Do you see that? So in Peter's message, he sees that they're believing. What does he direct them to do? Repent and be baptised. Not because baptism saves you, but that's the right thing to do. Jesus commanded it. Go and make disciples of all the nations and baptise them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. So now he speaks to them about baptism because they have believed. They have become convicted who Jesus is. That's the right order, isn't it? And so... They got baptised, 3,000 of them. And let me now explain to you a few things about baptism. Baptism is a beautiful thing. Okay, first of all, when we get baptised, if we are believers in Jesus, we are being obedient to Jesus. That's a good thing, isn't it? It brings him joy. He would have been smiling in heaven to see uh, Michelle and Karen get baptised. And we're filled with joy too. It's always good to obey the Lord. So it's great. Praise the Lord for obedience. And if you haven't been baptised yet and you do believe and you've called on Jesus to save you, then you ought to get baptised. Even just for this reason. To please the Lord. To do his will. Doesn't save you, but it's a good thing to please Jesus. But then there's other things about baptism. Baptism is God's cool way, as we saw today, for Michelle and Karen to tell us very clearly, to testify that they belong to Jesus. They testified publicly, didn't they? That they, are, that they belong to Jesus. They have committed themselves to Christ. It's always good to do that. It becomes in our Christian life like a landmark and we can return to it. Maybe when we're going through hard times and we can remember that day when I was baptised, when I publicly declared my faith in Jesus. Sometimes we need things like that because they get shaken in our life. But the really, really wonderful thing about baptism, one of the really great things about baptism, I love this, God never does things random. You know that, don't you? There's always a reason for anything. And baptism has also amazing, uh, it's an amazing reason for baptism. God has chosen baptism because in baptism there is a most wonderful picture. Wow! We have it in communion. 
We have bread. There's a picture there. Jesus is the bread of life. He gave himself for the world. The cup is red to remind us of the blood of Christ. Baptism has pictures too. All right, what's the picture? Well, proper baptism is meant to be immersion, not a sprinkling, because the picture is in the immersion, not in the sprinkling. And when you get baptised by immersion, you go under the water. Doesn't take long to realise if you stayed under the water, didn't happen today, <laughs> then you're going to die. Because in baptism, the first part of baptism, there is a picture of death. We even seek to put the uh, people down this way as a form of uh, being buried. It, it's a picture that I, am, I have chosen to die to myself, to die to, to running my life my way. Even when it comes to getting right with God my way, I die to that. And when you come up out of the water, it's a picture that you have now trusted in Jesus and you are living for him. You have a new life in Christ. It's all in baptism. What a picture. The thing is, it doesn't happen when you get baptised. It happens the moment when you're called on Jesus to save you. Baptism is a celebration of what has happened in your life. In baptism, great. Thank you, Lord, for coming up with this great picture for us. A wonderful picture. I've died in Christ and now I am alive in Christ. And I've got to read to you what Paul says about this in Romans chapter 6 verse 4. In Romans chapter 6 verse 4. The Apostle Paul says, We have been buried with him through baptism into death, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Wow, baptism is a picture of being buried and coming alive. It's, almost, it's saying to us that it's like we are uh, entering into what Christ did for us, how he died for us and rose again. And we do, we have this new life in Christ. All because of the Holy Spirit coming to dwell in us at the moment we gave our life to Jesus. Righty oh. So now, when you get baptised, so Michelle and Karen, what now? Well, that's it, is it? That's it, right? Nothing else to do. No, wrong! No, wrong. And I'm going to read and spend a little bit of time and then finish on verse 42. Right, let me read verses 41 and 42 of Acts 2. So then those who had received his word were baptised and that day there were added three, about 3,000 souls. Ah, look at verse 42. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. They didn't get baptised and then that's it. Right? I hope you understand that. The Christian life is a wonderful life. It's a journey. It's heading to glory and there are things to do. And I've got to tell you, verse 42, great verse. Great verse to know and live out. Okay, there are four things that we should be continually devoted to. Right, this takes the top, this takes everything, right? This is how it's meant to be. It's not the footy. It's not the career. It's not this. It's not that. If we are, are lovers of Jesus, then these are the four things that should be we're continually devoted to. They are very, very specific and special. So Karen and Michelle, and for anyone who is a Christian, then let us be devoted to these four things. Okay, what are the four things? We are to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. I love how it says the apostles' teaching. The apostles' teaching is the New Testament. It's interesting, it's very specific. New Testament. The apostles of Jesus wrote the New Testament. What do you do with the Old Testament? Love it. Read the Old Testament through the eyes of the New Testament. Yes, read the whole Bible. But the apostles' teaching, the New Testament, is how we are to live our life. That's why we often say to people who are new Christians or who would like to become a Christian, we don't say, read Leviticus. <laughs> no, or read Chronicles. They are great books, don't get me wrong. We tell them to read the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. That's right. And that's where we should start. We, we listen to what the apostles have said about Jesus. So we need to read. We need to read, let me say, the Word of God. That's, we are to be continually devoted to that. I love it in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. 
It says, like newborn babies crave for the pure spiritual milk of the word. That's the Bible. So that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. Beautiful verse. All no babies need milk. And we need the milk of God's word that we might grow. Okay, the next thing that we are to be continually devoted to is fellowship. That's like this. This is fellowship. You beauty. Hanging out together in the name of Jesus. Not socialising. But fellowship means in the name of Jesus we come together. And we come together to encourage one another. You need to be continually devoted to it. One of the best ways to go off track and lose your way is to not go to church. Not go to home group or Bible groups. And, and it doesn't take long before the little flame that was in me is starting to dwindle, like a coal taken out of a fire. It starts to go cold. We need the warmth of each other. That's God's way. Great verse in, in Hebrews chapter 10 about this. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more, as you see the day drawing near. Amen. Fellowship. Love it. Tell you what, in the days we live, we need fellowship more than ever as we have a world becoming more hostile to the Christian faith. Wow. It's a really important thing. So Karen and Michelle, be devoted to fellowship. Next thing you need to be devoted to is the breaking of bread. This is a beautiful little phrase coined in the New Testament to refer to communion. Breaking of bread, be devoted to it. That is to say, be devoted to remembering Jesus. It's so essential. Isn't it interesting that Jesus didn't command us to uh, meet together and celebrate his resurrection or his teaching? It's his death. He wants to remind us of what he did for us because that's going to help us live the Christian life. We are to remind, be reminded of his incredible grace and how he, the Son of God, gave his life up for me. We have to remember that regularly. Remember Jesus. I'm glad we do that once a week. There's no rules on this, but it's good to do it regularly. Once a week. Even tonight, as we come together for Pilgrim's Progress, we will break bread and remember him who gave himself for us, who loves us. And the last thing that we are to be devoted in is prayer. And I love how we can be devoted to prayer because one of the cool things that Jesus did for us is when he died upon the cross... Something happened in the temple. The great curtain was torn in two from top to bottom to uh, symbolise to all of us that through his death, the way is open for us to come into the presence of God. We can pray in the name of Jesus. And God hears us. God's our Father. But we need to be devoted to prayer. Even though the door's been opened, we need to pray. And we need to pray regularly. Hebrews chapter 4 Verse 16 says, Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and may find grace to help in time of need. That's a great verse. Hebrews 4.16. And before that verse it talks about Jesus being our great high priest who understands our weaknesses. He's there right before the throne of our Father and he wants us to pray. So, I'm going to look at Michelle and Karen. Build on. And blossom. That's the next B word. It was belief, baptism, now build on. All right, don't stagnate. You need to do that by continually devoting yourselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And just wrapping things up, now I'm going to look at everyone else. How are you going? I hope you haven't stagnated. I hope you're not going backwards. It's a real issue in our life. If that is the case, let's be honest. Then if that's the case... You need to live out Acts 2.42. Get back into it. Devote yourself to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Otherwise you will not grow, you will start dying. And for all of us here, and I don't know all your hearts, if you haven't come yet to know the Lord Jesus, if you've never called on him to save you, then I urge you to do that. I'd urge you to do that today. Just uh, come, even after the service, you can see me, you can do it on your own. All you need to do <coughs> is ask the Lord Jesus to forgive you of your sins and to come into your life. You need to call on him. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise his name.
All right, we're going to sing now uh, this song, This Life I Live. When you have called on the name of the Lord, then there's one thing we want to do. We want to live our life for Jesus. And that's what this song celebrates. Before I pray, I'm just going to read one verse I left out. I wanted to leave it out to the last. It's interesting, you know, Peter sharing and helping these people come to faith in Christ. In verse 40, he says, And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on urging them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Do you understand those words? Do you understand the seriousness it is to be saved? through faith in Christ. We won't go down well meeting God one day without Jesus in our life. We need him. I can't help but see Peter's heart just bursting as he, he looks at all those people. He loves them. He's urging them to do the most important thing, turn to Jesus and be saved. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you so much for how we could uh, look at the book of Acts this morning, Acts chapter 2, and thank you for... Just looking so, it's so plain that uh, Peter has to preach to them first about believing in Jesus before baptism occurs. And thank you that on that special day you were pleased to draw and, and uh, help understand your gospel. And 3,000, wow, 3,000 people became Christians. Legitimate Christians, real Christians. And we thank you that they responded to Jesus and they called on Jesus to save them. We also thank you for how right at the beginning... We get, we get to see that they got baptised straight away. They, they understood that was, that was a requirement in terms of what Jesus has asked us to do. And thank you for their obedience. And Father, I pray that for all of us here, there's going to be three groups of us really. There are going to be people who aren't saved yet. And so Lord, in the words of the Apostle Peter, we can't help but pray to you and ask Father that you would help us to come to love your Son. And for those of us who have, but we haven't been baptised, 
I ask that you would plead for us to, to be baptised. And Lord, for those of us who have believed truly and baptised, I pray that you would help us to live out Acts chapter 242. And Lord, I've got to say sorry for the times when we are neglecting these essential things to our own detriment and our life becomes just wrecked and we lose our way. Please would you call us all to be living out those words, continually devoted to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And as a result, may your church be rekindled and refined and put in revival mode that we might light up this dark world and be the salt of the earth. Thank you so much, Father, that the things that we are to do are so simple and we forget the simple things. So help us to be about these things. Thank you for this special time we've had today. Thank you for your very special presence. Thank you, Father, for your work in our midst, even with everything happening. Thank you for your ministry to our own spirit. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.